This is a map of Dallas, Texas, and each one of these red dots represents the location of a smart meter. I was able to receive this data while driving down the freeway with a software-defined radio and my laptop. The smart meters transmit their location information along with the amount of time that they've been running since they last experienced a power outage. Meters that are low to the ground, like this one, have only been running for a few days. Meters that are much higher like this one up here, have been running significantly longer. This one for 1,783 days. Okay, so let's talk about why I thought there would even be GPS coordinates in this data to begin with, and a general overview of how the system functions. This is a paper that's available from the IEEE that was written by some people that work at Landis and Gear, and it gave an overview of this new mesh networked smart meter system that they had designed. And inside this paper was something that I found incredibly interesting, and it was what they described as a geographical routing protocol. And this beginning part is the most interesting. It's a system that supports peer-to-peer -peer communication by employing a routing scheme which utilizes the geographical coordinates, latitude and longitude of the communicating nodes, nodes being smart meters. And so if we look at just a high level diagram, there are the meters themselves, the nodes, all spaced throughout a neighborhood that send their data up to a router or sometimes a collector can look like this type of device. And then over to what they typically call a collector, which is a locked box inside of a substation usually with a pole with four antennas on it. Inside of this box are some of these radios, which also look like this. There are four of these types of radios in one of these collectors. And inside of the smaller white collector I have, which is like this, is one of the raw boards, which is basically the same as what's inside of here. Now let's look at this, and what this is showing is a dot for every smart meter location on the map, a star for the routers that carry the data back to the collector. So the way this network works, the light, the really light circles here, means it only takes one to two hops to get the signal back to a collector or perhaps to a router. It doesn't um, clarify on this that I'm showing here, but basically one to two hops before it leaves the, the meter hopping and ends up somewhere on a backhaul type of a network. And the dark colored ones are where it takes a lot of hops to get back. And so the, the high level theory of how this works is that the meters are aware of their location and they are aware of the location that they need to send their signal to and so when this meter here broadcasts out, the meters around it are aware of where this message is trying to go. And so the next closest meter or whichever meter it is that hears it, broadcasts it and they keep doing that along the chain until they get it to a router or a collector. So let's take a look at the packets that have this GPS data in them. These are what I refer to as a 5-5 packet. They are broadcast out about once every minute, and they contain a certain amount of information. There's the header, the type of the packet, this 5-5, the length of the packet, what's referred to as the WAN address, the uptime information, which is what you saw plotted on that uh, Google Earth image, their LAN address, which is just a sticker, that's on the front of the smart meter. In this case, you can see it here. It's on the front of every meter. They list their LAN address. Some timing data that we'll get into in another video. The checksum, which is how the, the data here is verified to be correct when I receive it. And so this is Encore, and this area here is what we'll see is the GPS data. Now, not everyone has to do this. If we look at CoServe, which is another provider here, they don't actually embed any GPS data in their WAN address. Their address is simply the sticker on the front of the meter with an FE in the front of it and a 00 behind it. Now in order to figure out how this WAN address converted to GPS coordinates, I needed to find some data. So what I did was search online and find all the manuals that were written for these devices that were available as part of a FCC testing or anything else, anything that was available on the internet. And I scrolled through every single one of those manuals um, over some number of hours. And what I was looking for was things like this. So here's a menu 
and it shows the user how they're supposed to enter in the data for the location. It shows here's the, the latitude, the longitude, a drop down for if it's north, south, east, or west, the color code, and then it shows you the output. So this is that WAN address that it has generated from this data. And so I found a bunch of these, um, about eight that were unique. There was a lot of samples that were used that were the same ones, but eight that were uniquely different. In this case, it's shown up here in this menu. Here's the, the GPS coordinates, C for color and zero, and then the WAN address that, that came from that. So taking all of these samples, we'll go over and take a look at how I was able to decode the GPS coordinates from the WAN address. So now let's dig in. This is eight samples after scouring all kinds of manuals and everything online, looking for those specific charts like I just showed you with location information. So what I was looking for is the GPS location and the converted WAN address. And so this represents the input and this represents the output over here. And with enough samples, I could look at these and try to compare the data and understand what's going on. The first step is to take the hex data it was on the end, the WAN address, and convert this to binary. So each one of these, FE, FE, is just the hex value converted to binary so that we can look at the individual bits. Because when I looked at the hex data itself right here, I couldn't quite make out what was happening. Like why is this value here translated into this? And there wasn't anything completely obvious looking at the hex data. So the next step is to take it all the way down to binary. What I did do though, was organize this left column from smallest to largest. So from negative 88 all the way up increasing values here. So at least one column I could try to look at and make some sense out of. Now I did this for every single value that I had. I basically put all the bits right next to each other so that I could try to look for patterns. And you saw in the way the data was entered in the previous section, there was drop downs for certain things, like each value had a drop down, the north, south, east, west had a drop down, and the color code had a drop down. So what I'm looking for here is to see, okay, where might we be specifying north, south, the color code, anything like that. And what's nice on this one is that the bottom one here had a color code of two. And so very quickly, I can see that all this data on the end, these are all zeros. And from reading other manuals, I found out that the color code could have 32 unique values. And so five bits gives you from zero to 31, which is 32 values. And we see here this bit is set. And this is the, the second bit in binary. So this represents the value two. So I was pretty certain that these last five bits, I could kind of you know account for those as the color code. Looking at these other bits, we see one, 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 and then all zeros, we see negative, 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 and all positive. So I thought this first one here might be a representative of north or south, with south being negative and north being positive. And if we keep going over some bits here, they're all kind of different. So what I'm doing is looking down the columns and seeing where's something here that uniquely matches some information over here. And if we see here, we have positive, 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 and then all negative. So now I'm looking for zero, 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 and then a bunch of ones. And I find that over here. So we might say that this is the start of the longitude and this is the latitude section. And so if we slice it up, what we see is that we have 20 bits for the latitude and a north-south indicator. And initially I had assumed 20 bits for the longitude with an east-west, an unknown field that I didn't know what to do with, and the color code. And so this 20-bit value and this 20-bit value converts to this in hex. But after a little reading, I realized that the east-west value was 21 bits. And so now looking at this data, we see that we have north-south, 20 bits, east-west, 21 bits, and the color code. And so this is that converted into hex up top here for each section and the value. Now it's quite a leap from there to here. 
And so what happened is I was taking values and I was looking at them and trying to figure out how does this translate into something else? And so I was converting these to different numbers, you know, from hex to decimal, and then I was dividing them by the other values. And when I divided this one, this 3A38, which is 14,904 by 2.55, so you see this 2.55 and this 3A38. So I was, what I was trying to do is correlate these values. So if I have this as a longitude, how does it convert into the decimal value, the floating point value we see over there? And so when I divided those two, I got the number 5825.422 and some other stuff on the end, but it was pretty clear that 422 was the, the kind of ending part of that value. And so I went to Google and I typed that in because a couple other ones that I divided also got that value. And so I knew it, it felt like I was onto something there. And when I went to Google, this page showed up. This result, geohash my positions, is a page about converting some data that was posted into latitude and longitude. And I knew when I saw this 5825.422 that I must be on to something. Now the reality is that value was based on assuming that the longitude was 20 bits instead of 21. When we take 2 to the 20 divided by 90 for the latitude, we get this value right here, 11,650. If we take 2 to the power of 21, for 21 bits, so the total unique values that you have when you have 21 bits of information, divided by 180, which is what's used for longitude, we also get this same value. So I put this here because this is basically part of the process that led me to realize that I was looking at GPS data, but ultimately it ended up being the wrong value in the end. Now, once I had this information, it was just a matter of figuring out where does the 90 and the 180 come into play. And so in this case, we take 90 subtracted from the value of the latitude divided by this value here, which gives us the latitude as 46.60. We do the same for longitude, just in a little bit of a different order. Now all this depends on whether the value is positive or negative. So figuring it out for all of them, I came up with this generic high level conversion that you see in the Python program that I wrote. So if the latitude's negative, we perform this function. If it's positive, we do this instead. Same for longitude. And that's how we take the raw value labeled as the WAN address and convert it into GPS coordinates. Now let's take a look at a few ways you can receive this data. The first one I'll show is Dragon OS, which is a really cool bootable Linux-based operating system. And you can start this thing right up and virtually every kind of software defined radio tool you want to experiment with is already set up for you to, to start out. If you want to get a little further into it, the GNU radio out of tree module that I designed is here on my GitHub. You can download that over here on the wiki is documentation on how to set it up and install it. And part of that is discovering what is the CRC, the, the, the checksum calculation value that is used for your area. So I've listed a few sample ones here that I have discovered. Um, it's rather simple. It's part of the wiki page. It'll show you how to do it and, and you can uh, contribute to this as well. In here you'll see currently support four different software defined radios. Really any of them would work. The more bandwidth you have, the better. This is the Python script I referenced that shows how I decode the latitude and longitude, which is very similar to the sample code that I put on the other document. Finally, on the wiki itself, you'll see there's a whole area devoted to these smart meters. If you're interested in the protocol, all the paper point presentations that I gave, all the data is here that shows these different packets, the information that was received and more data about it. Along with, at the bottom, some captures of data if you're interested in downloading that to take a look at. If you're interested in other videos like this or want to learn more about the Smart Meter Network, you can check out my YouTube channel or have other videos as well discussing different topics related to smart meters. This is a slightly modified version of the data that is output from the Python script that I wrote. The Python script outputs the meter ID, the uptime in seconds, the uptime in days, 
the latitude and longitude of each meter it receives. For visualizing purposes, I removed the number of seconds the meter has been up, and I took the number of days and created a separate column called description with it in there. In Google Earth, what this means is that each red dot when you mouse over it will show the name of the meter ID. If you click it, you will see the number of days it has been up in the box. By labeling this elevation, that is how the red dots are raised above or below the map, and then this is the location that is plotted. The website that allows me to convert this CSV file into a KML file, which is what Google Earth uses, is called gpsvisualizer.com. It's got just a few settings you need to use. I set that I want a KML uncompressed to download. I make sure the altitude mode is clamped to ground. And probably the most important part is to set this altitude mode relative to ground plus extruded. You choose your CSV file here, and then you click Create KML. And it will output a KML file like this that you double click and loads right into Google Earth. 